Hello and welcome to the 2019-2020 ESSA application training geared to Region 10 staff. I'm Allison Fears, your Assistant Director for Special Revenue, and today is June 4th, 2019. Thank you so much for joining us and we're going to kick off our training today. Hello, everyone. Okay, here's the contact information for your Special Revenue team. Please feel free to contact any one of us should you have a question as you go through your application. But here are our email addresses and our phone numbers. So please make sure you reach out to us. We're here to help you as you go through the application. Let's talk about the steps to begin the application process. The first thing you want to do is update your applicant information. That's your GS2100. When I say applicant information, I'm talking about your contacts. There's a max of 20 contacts this year. And this is for all of your federal programs, your SPED, your Perkins, and your SF program. So please be sure that you do make sure you add everybody in who will need access to the application because their names will be in a drop down box as they go through each part of the application certifying their certificate. Okay. Second, you're going to work on your formula grant consolidated schedule. And what is that? It's your SC5003. And this is a new form this year because it is a consolidated schedule for all three of your funding sources. So that is a very, very important thing to fill out because if you don't have that completed, your ADC and your applications will not open. Number three is your applicant designation and certification form, which is your ADC, your GS2230. This is the same form we've had in the past. This is for, you will go in there, it's still the same one for each, uh, for each of your funding sources that each have their own ADC form. Here's where you designate your fiscal agent as well as let people know if you are applying on your own or choosing not to apply for certain funds. On this page, you will have to have your contacts in there because you will have to use a drop down box to certify your signature form. Number four is your campus selection, your SC5000, everybody's favorite section. The good news is on here, there is the option to populate from last year. So that should hopefully save you guys some time. I'm going to let Vanessa get all over that for you guys later. Number five is the program budget, your BS pages. And we'll go through those. There have been some, some big changes, the 6101, so we will talk about that. Number six is your program description, your PS pages. And then number seven are your provisions, assurances, and certifications, your PS 7000. So let's talk about your roles in e grants, because there should be a grantee official or an authorized official. It's always advisable to have at least two, and these are the people who have the authority to submit applications and to bind the applicant into a contractual agreement. So you want to be sure that you have the right two people in there, and should someone leave, you want to update that, because they will receive the emails should there be any changes when your NOGA is, uh, your NOGA is given out, when you get any emails, or when you amendments. This is a big, uh, this is who will get these, these notifications. We'll also have a grantee manager, which is your local project or business manager. This is usually your primary or secondary contact. And they will assist in completing and uh, your reporting requirements, saving your data. There's also a role as a grantee staff that the employees or contracted personnel. And they just have the option to view the application. They, send, they may have the access to write or edit, but they're not able to submit anything on your behalf. There's also the option to have a grantee writer or editor. So they they can get in and edit things, save things, but they cannot. Uh, certify and submit on your behalf, and they don't have access to your reporting requirements. So these are the options you have as your roles in e-grant. So as you go through and begin working on your application, make sure you're in Internet Explorer. I know it's 2019, the TEA is not, we're not there yet with them, okay, y'all? So make sure you are in Internet Explorer before you start working on it. There are a few new pages. The new pages sometimes can be done in Chrome, but instead of having to go back and forth, I advise you to stay in Internet Explorer. Also, be sure you're saving often. After so many minutes, it will time you out. And if you have not hit save, you will lose all your work. I've been there. I've done that several times. It's super frustrating. Don't let that happen to you. Also, you want to make sure that you're logged into eGrants, which is now in Teal. So say you, uh, say you did never migrate over to Teal, you will not have access to eGrants. So make sure you have a login. So that is new this year to go through Teal. It's a new process. Make sure that you have actually gotten your login you can access the grant. Okay, so let's talk about the SC5003. This is a new form. I know we've had lots of questions as this has come up. I um, you guys have been working on that. It did open on May 1st this year and is a new schedule and it is required for all LEAs and for us at the ESC to complete. So the way this used to be, it used to be a separate schedule on every single application, but now it's a consolidated schedule. 
So part one is the equitable access and participation. So a lot of people had questions about what kind of barriers do we have? Do we have to have a barrier on here? And the answer, the short answer is no, but the, the longer answer is if you have a barrier, you should identify it. And it is for all, all three funding sources. So if you have any barriers for special education or curriculum or essay, you need to identify them here. So in the group drop down box, it will be a students, teachers, or other group options. And description, you will identify if you have any barriers. Don't think of barriers as something negative, just think of it as something that may be a reason for why you're not able to it provides the services of what we would like. So some option for that could be, you know, um, this for special ed, it could be visual impairments of the barrier for your students or they are for others like parents. There's also when we talked about on the phone there, there was a couple of people who had questions about absenteeism for teachers and for students. So here's where you would just put you would put absenteeism or truancy as for teachers and students in two separate options. But you don't have to put your strategies to overcome these barriers. That will be maintained locally. So you not have to put that description is just of the barrier, not of your strategy. Okay. Okay, so once you get past part one, you'll join you'll go into part two is the guidelines for vision assurances and certification. So you will see all the general and fiscal guidelines and always asking you in that first section is about lobbying activity. It doesn't mean if you have a membership to Casbo or something, it means more if you are paying for somebody to influence. Uh, influence lobbyists to, on your behalf. So if you have over $100,000 in federal funds, you will need to at least get, you will need to answer this. If the answer is no, the SF Perkins and Special Education section at number two will not be accessible for you to, to click on anymore. So you will just say yes or no. And if you do have a lobby, if you are lobbying, you will you will need to upload that in the lobbying certification section. Once you pass that, you'll go on to part D, which is specific guidelines and provisions. These are the same pages we've always had for each of your funding sources talking about the program guidelines and what's allowable. And you just, you're just going to sign off and check this box saying you have read those and you understand the rules for each of your funding sources. This isn't anything new. I don't want you to be frightened by this. It might need to maybe change the guidelines. It's the same stuff we've always done. There aren't any surprises in there. And if there are, we will help you do them. Okay. Once you get past the B section on C, you'll certify that box and you'll go in and you'll certify and submit your SC5003. Here again, if you have not put your contacts in or put the correct contacts in, the person will not be in the drop down box for you to certify and submit. So at the very bottom, the section that people have got you to write in on that section, but once you hit certify and submit, it will pre -populate, it will populate for you on your behalf. Okay, so don't worry about filling in that last section. All right, so now let's jump into the actual application. All right, so I kind of talked about the, the ADC already, but here's what it looks like, all right? So I think we've all seen this plenty of times. However, if you are applying on your own, you will check the apply on your own box if you're applying as an SSA member or if you're applying, uh, if you're not applying at all. If you're applying as a fiscal agent or SSA member, it should only be me saying that one. So make sure you're only looking at the apply on your own, not applying at all, or applying as a member of the SSA. If you are part of the SSA, once you click that box, it will, a pop-up will pop up saying that you are a requirement of SSA, you'll say yes, and then you'll select region 10, preferably. I want you to be with us, not with anybody else. Okay, once you've gone through and completed all the options on your ADC, you will go ahead and certify and submit. And again, right here where it says select your contact, it is a drop-down box. When you drop it down, make sure you have put the correct names again, otherwise you'll have to go back to your contacts and refill that information in. You'll just save it and you'll move on to the next section of the application. Which is, oops, if you just trying to submit in case you guys want to see that. Sorry, I was going a little fast as I was scrolling through. And now we'll start the PS 3109, the refunding and transferability section. Hi y'all, this is Laura. I want to talk to you for a moment about the PS3109. This is where you indicate if you're going to be transferring any Title II or Title IV funds out into another program. So uh, for both of those, for both REIT and transferability, if you're not transferring 
funds, you can just click does not apply. If you are transferring, you just need to indicate the percentage of that particular program that you are transferring out under the column that you are transferring it to. It's pretty simple. I want to recommend that you do this schedule before you do some of your other schedules, like the private school schedule, because on the schedules that auto populate your planning amount, um, if you start working in those and then you come back and transfer money, you're going to mess up those other schedules. So go ahead and make this decision about transferability first before you do the other program schedule. Okay. And then after this, we're going to talk for a moment about the private school schedule. Then in doing so, I want to log in to Teal for a minute. And I'm going to show you how you get to all of this. All right, so when you're looking for, you know, I've done my, um, where is my grant application? If you go to grants, okay, and then apply for eligible grants, that's initially where you will find it. But once you've started, you'll go to grants and process. Here's your 1920 as the consolidated federal grant application. And then here's your ABC and your consolidated federal grant application. So when you click on the consolidated federal grant application, Here's all those fund schedules that we're talking with you about. And one of those is your PS3099, the Private Nonprofit School Equitable Services Schedule. Now on this one, you start out at the top, are any private nonprofit schools located within LEA's boundaries, yes or no? And do you have any eligible, Title I eligible students attending private nonprofit schools outside your boundaries, yes or no? Now, for those who just click no, no, the rest of the schedule is going to collapse and you're going to be done. Similarly, Tartar, you won't even have this schedule, lucky you. But for the rest of us who answer yes, you'll then need to select your program in which you actually have CMPs participating. Then there are two assurances to click. And then as you come down, I'm not going to belabor every single part of this, but I just want to show you a little bit about how it auto calculates. So for example, on the Title I Part A schedule, you'll put your total low income enrollment in your district from Title I attendance area. So let's imagine that you have 10,000 low income students. And then the next line on line two, you'll put your low income private school enrollment. If you're in the PMP cooperatives or our SSA, that's a number that I'll be sending to you shortly. We're still crunching those right now, but they're almost ready. So let's imagine there were 50 low income private school students. Then you could see when I did that, how all of these other lines suddenly auto populated. Okay. Um, on line five and six, if you did transfer money in from Title II or Title IV, those would appear there. And then the trickiest part is line 10, administration of the program. This is an amount, if you have an amount tied to the actual administration of the Title I program for PMP students. I will give you, if you're in the cooperative or the SSA, the suggested amount I think you should put in there. But if you don't know what to put in there, I'll be happy to talk with you about it at one of our application work sessions or just give you some technical assistance over the phone. So anyway, in a similar fashion, you go through this schedule, just adding your LEA data and your private school data for each program, and then it will auto calculate your set aside amount for private schools based on those answers. And you'll be done. It looks like a scary schedule, but it's really not that bad. So I'm going to scroll on down through that one on our draft application here. And then next up is our Title I Part A schedule, the PS3101. Great. 
Greetings all, this is Lauren McKinney. I'm gonna go over the 3101 with you, which is your Title I Part A program schedule. As you can see, this program schedule is insanely short. So this is part one and part two, and then you're done. All right, I'm gonna get up and walk away from the this one. Okay, so let's go through this. Your funding amounts. If you were actually logged into your e-grant system, your funding amount will calculate for you right here on the screen. This will let you know what's already been uh, allocated theoretically when you're thinking about your planning amounts here in this box. Now, the Title II Part A and Title IV Part A, these are grayed out in the drafts because it's working off the premise that you're not transferring your funding in. However, if you think back to what Laura just said a few minutes ago when she went over that CS3109, that is your REIT and or transfer, your REIT and or your transfer page. So you can transfer funding from there. Whatever you put in that 3109, it's going to pre-populate here if you indicated that you were transferring money in from your Title One, your Title II Part A into your Title I Part A. That will populate here on the screen for you. If you transferred money in from Title IV Part A into your Title I Part A, that will also populate for you in these boxes. So instead of them being grayed out, you would have actual figures there. So this will just duplicate whatever it is that you put in your 3109, which is your REIT and or transferability program schedule. So be very sure about what you're putting in there because it will impact your other funded sources, as you see here. Something else that's important to remember this year as you're planning for 1920, when you're thinking about that SF consolidated, whatever you put in that 3109 will then impact how you operate that federally funded program. So for example, we all know that if my LEA is, has $500,000 or more worth of Title I Part A federal funding, then I'm required to operate a district-wide parent and family engagement program. But let's say my LEA had 490,000. That was my planning amount in line one. Well, if I transferred in 5,000 from Title II Part A and transferred in 5,000 from Title IV Part A, I am now sitting at exactly $500,000 worth of Title I Part A funding, which means when I get down here, Part B, I think it's conducted, I would have to check, yes, I am doing a district-wide parent and family engagement activities initiative uh, because I am now sitting at $500,000 or more in according to federal statute. If I have total allocation, $500,000 or more in my Title I Part A, I am required to operate a parent and family engagement program, a district-wide program, okay? So, and of course, the percentage that you have to set aside is 1%. But be aware of that. With these transferring, this is the first year that it will impact you in this way. Whatever you have on line four, if it's 500,000 or more, you are required to operate that district wide parent and family engagement activity. One other kind of side note with this the way the application is rolling this year, let's say I transferred in 499,000, so my line four had 499, that was my total allocation. When reallocation occurs later on this year, if I get an extra thousand dollars in my Title I and I am now sitting at five hundred thousand dollars in my Title I Part A, you are required to operate a district-wide parent and family engagement activities program. So just be aware of that. Be strategic with if you're transferring in funding, how much you're transferring it into. Okay. Let's go into Part B. Well, Part One, Section B. We've already gone over district-wide parent and family engagement activities. If your LEA is receiving $500,000 or more of your Title I Part A funding, uh, you can draw your answers. You are required to set aside at least 1% to operate that program. As an FYI, you still have to do parent and family engagement activities. So even if you don't have $500,000, let's say I have $50,000, you still got to do a district wide parent and family engagement kind of initiative, but it just does not require a certain percentage that you set aside. If your gross is under 500,000. Number two, Title I Part A services to eligible PSPs, not including your administration. Laura's already covered that with you. As a reminder, whatever you put in at PS3099 will populate for you on this screen as well. So it should match what you had in your 3099. Same thing with your number three, administration of Title I Part A programs for eligible private school students. Whatever you placed in at PS3099, which is your private nonprofit schedule, should match uh, what you have here. Preschool programs. 
you, uh, if you're operating a preschool program, you can go ahead and set aside funding for that out of your district-wide Title I funding. For those of us that are new to a federal funding, or those of us who like to watch the webinars to reappoint ourselves with some of the requirements, as an FYI, if you click that you have a preschool program here in line four, that means that within your FC 5000, you have at least one campus that has a preschool program associated with its um, formal program, so your tenure program, okay, your K through five. So just make sure if you click on the box there for that preschool program that they can go back and then look at your SP5000 and see that you have at least one campus on that SP5000 that has a preschool program attached to your K12, uh, K5 or however you have it sectioned off program. Okay. Uh, the rest of these have not changed. Your administration, if you want to set aside funding for that for your Title I Part A, your district wide professional development is still there. Services to homeless students. Box seven. In the past, we've always kind of said, hey, set aside something there that is a requirement, um, but the percentage or the amount was totally up to you. Well, I do want to let you know we've had recently some um, additional revenue, additional webinars that have occurred on uh, the TEA has facilitated, and they very specifically stated that they did not want to see some small nominal amounts there. So they don't want you to put a dollar in. For box seven services to homeless students because they have to then justify those amounts to the U.S. Department of Education. So they want you to be specific and strategic with the amount that you set aside for your services to homeless students. Eight, if you have students residing in local facilities selected, nine is for local facility service zones with the account delinquent. Foster care transportation, you are allowed to set aside something out of your Title I Part A for that as well. Other, you have listed here uh, in the past some common ones that we've seen is the career trained professional or support staff professional development. If there's something that you're interested in possibly setting aside for that, give us a call here. Your special revenue services team would be more than happy to walk through that with you and provide additional technical assistance and support. Part two, that's just if there's any additional anything that you want to insert there, um, but do not feel the need to type something in here. It's not required. It is optional. That is it for your Title I Part A schedule, your 3101. At this time, I am going to, um, well, briefly, let's talk about your Title I Part A neglected and Title I Part B subpart two uh, delinquent schedule. Vanessa Delacatat is going to come up and go over some of the other pieces with you. But just to quickly go through this, we have very few facilities within our boundaries that actually uh, apply for this, or this is funded source for them. So if you have questions about it, let us know. We can help you with it. As you see here, uh, some of this information will pre-populate from last year. So if you were operating a facility for the neglected and for delinquent, this will populate from last year's within your grant system. If they're newly closed, this part has not changed it. So if anything um, comes up and you're unsure as to how to do this, let us know. With your part two plan expenditures, you know, make sure that you are doing these things. Um, if you have a question about anything, again, specific to any of your plan expenditure options here, um, let us know. Your 3103, your Title I Part C Migrant Education Program Schedule. We're going to go ahead and skip through that, but if you have any questions in regards to that, please let your special revenue team be made aware because we do have an entire team of folks in our teaching and learning uh, department who can assist with this as well. All right, you see how quick these program schedules are? They are a lot smaller than what they used to be. At this time, I'm going to turn this over to Vanessa Delacritas, who's going to cover your Title II Part A. Hi, all, it's Vanessa. I'm going to talk to you about Title II and uh, about Title III. With Title II Part A, if you look up here to the top right, uh, you can check the box if your LEA has directed 100% of their Title II Part A funds to be ranked on funding for stability. If you come down to Part A here, you have your planned expenditures. You have to check at least one of these. If you have PMPs on your 3099, line five, 
uh, regarding the professional development that includes classroom instruction and student learning should be selected. If it is not selected, the application negotiator will probably ask you questions. Now looking at line six, if it's selected, there should be payrolls for Title II at the campus level. Uh, that is the evidence-based class size reduction that needs to increase student learning. And like the last schedule, we have part two, a nexus, additional information, and if it is optional. All right, uh, your PS 3106 is Title III, Part A, English Language Acquisition, your PLA. This schedule has been streamlined as uh, immigrant is now uh, part of its own schedule. So under Part 1, LEA Local Plan, there are three tables. So for section A, the supplemental activities, the language instruction educational program. So the LEA must choose at least one. It is not required to select all options, but at least one activity must be selected. A change this year is that there is not the other option on this uh, table, which is A. For uh, section B, supplemental activities, parent, family, community engagement, all three boxes here. All three must be checked as all three activities are required under Title III. And you'll get an error message uh, if all of the boxes are not selected. Moving on to Section C, Supplemental Activities, Professional Development. Um, so this is a new section. Professional Development would move from Table B to Table C. Uh, you must choose one of the of options one through five. You have your instructional strategies for English learners, understanding and implementation of assessment of English learners, understanding and implementation of ELP standards and academic content standards for English learners, subject matter, knowledge for teachers, and alignment of curriculum and language instruction educational programs for ELP standards. You may in this case choose other, and if it is selected, you would ensure the description is readable to actually be indicated. Part two again, uh, additional information. And this section was part three in last year's application. And again, it is optional. Now, Lauren is going to talk to you about. Oh, I apologize. I apologize. I'm still up. The PS uh, 3114. This is now, like I said earlier, uh, Title III Part A Immigrant is its own schedule. And it is open and active only to those receiving immigrant funds. You cannot switch Title III ELA funds uh, to provide immigrant activities. Let's look at Part 1, your local, your LEA local plan. These activities must be supplemental to what is already provided. And these, these funds, uh, as you know, are not guaranteed for good year. So you need to also use caution if you're using these funds for payroll. Section B, supplemental activities with parent, family, and community outreach. Uh, in this section, you may choose only one, or you may select NA. These activities are required in the PS 3106. That Title Three Part A ELA. Looking at Section C, Supplemental Activities, Support for Personnel. You may select one or both of the activities, but you cannot select NA and another box. So, if you select any of the other activities, like I said, you can't select NA. And then, though Part Two, additional information that is once again optional. Now, Lauren is going to talk to you about PS 3107, Title IV, Part A. I am back. Let's go over your 3107, your Title IV, Part A program schedule for 1920. I want to start off by noting to you that this little box at the top, if you're transferring or redirecting 100% of your Title IV, Part A allocation, the rest of the schedule will close down for you. You will not have to worry about it because you are indicating that you are transferring or redirecting or um, if that's an option for you. 
100% of your Title IV Part A funding to another federal legal aid source. I have a PSA and an FYI. If you have multiple fiscal agents, let's say Region 10 is your preferred fiscal agent for your Title I and your Title II, and then you're operating your own Title III and Title IV Part A uh, funding program, if you put in there that you're transferring 100% of it, and let's say you're transferring 100% of your Title IV to your Title I, and Region 10 is your preferred fiscal agent for your Title I, we won't be aware that you've transferred that funding unless you tell us. Uh, so please, uh, if you intend to transfer funding across uh, fiscal agents, uh, let us know if we're the other fiscal agents so that we can make sure that you are drawing down appropriately, that we are uh, assigning uh, costs to the correct source, okay? Okay, so let's say you are you are not redirecting 100% of your funding. You're going to have to fill out the rest of this program schedule. So part one, your plan usage of funds. Your current year planning amount, and it'll always be considered planning amounts until the very end, but your planning amount will populate here in this little first box for you. If you're transferring anything in from your Title II Part A or you're transferring out from your Title IV Part A, that will populate here as well. And to remind you that 3109 that Laura went over at the beginning of the webinar, your REIT and or funding transferability program schedule, that will show what you've decided to transfer in and out. So again, as she mentioned, and Laura mentioned, and then as I've already mentioned to you as well, be purposeful with what you are intending to transfer because it will impact everything else. So make that decision really before you start digging into the rest of the uh, 1920 SF consolidated application. So this little box here will let you know what the total allocations are minus what you've transferred either in or out. A lot of this has not changed in that if you have $30,000 or more awarded in your Title IV Part A uh, federal funded source, you are required to operate all parts of the program. If you have less than 30,000, you can choose which parts of the program you want to uh, operate. You're not required to operate all of those things, okay? So if you have an administration uh, direct admin cost that's your line one, you can set aside a maximum of 2% of your total allocation uh, to administrative costs. Line two, your activities to support well-rounded educational opportunities. You can provide all students with access to well-rounded ed. If you want to see specifically what these activities are, I advise you to have a look at your sections 4107, 4108, and 4109 of the statute, because that spells out specifically what is considered well-rounded ed opportunities, what's considered safe for other students, and what is considered effective use of this technology. Okay. But if you have uh, 30,000 or more, you are required to set aside at least 20% of your allocation to conduct activities to support well-rounded educational opportunity. If you have a total of 30,000 or more, you are required to set aside a minimum of 20% of the total allocation to support safe and healthy students. If you have $30,000 or more in this federally funded source, uh, you must budget some amount of the funding to your effective use of technology. And just as a side note, number five is the one that's been kind of throwing people off for the last like, couple of years that this source has been in place. Your technology infrastructure, again, go to your statute because your statute explicitly states what they consider to be technology infrastructure and what is not. Now, of what you set aside from line four, so your effective use of technology, you cannot earmark more than 15% of line four for your technology infrastructure, which is line five. So if I set aside $10,000 in line four, which is my effective use of technology, number five is going to be no more than 15% of that 10,000 that I set aside in line four. So of the 10,000 set aside, I cannot use more than 1,500 in that example for technology infrastructure. If you try to put a larger amount in there, it will give you error, okay? But if I have less than $30,000, and keep in mind again, 30,000 is that magic number after all allocations, after everything has been done, your reallocation, everything has been done. If you have $30,000 or more in that funding source, you're required to operate the entire program, which would be your well-rounded, which is safe and healthy, as well as your effective use of technology. If you have less than 30,000, it's not a requirement that you operate all portions of the program unless you just choose to. Going down into part two, your program requirement assurances. 
If you have $30,000 or more for the federal party, you are required to engage in the comprehensive needs assessment process. Uh, if you have less than $30,000, then you can click box two, which says I received less than $30,000. I have consulted with stakeholders to how to prioritize and use the funding, um, but I did not, it was not a requirement that I engaged in this DNA. I'm not saying that you didn't, but it was not a requirement. B, prioritize distribution of funds, $30,000 or more or $30,000 or less, you have to click that box because you did prioritize uh, usage of funds and according to the statute. Supplement not supplant. You are required to check a, a mark in boxes one and two because this is saying that this is supplemental in nature and that this is not something um, that you are doing um, for. I'm sorry, I got sidetracked because we had something else pop up on the screen. We had someone else join our webinar. Um, the supplement not supplant requirement is saying that this is a supplemental in that nature. It is not supplanting anything that was otherwise required uh, due to federal, state, or local uh, protections. Going down to Part D, uh, if you have any funding set aside in that well-rounded educational opportunity section, you are required to check the box here, just saying yes, we are engaging in activities and programs to support well-rounded education. If I had funding set aside in this, the uh, Safe and Healthy Students section, which is 1B, line 3, I am required to select that box saying I, we do have activities and programs for the targeted group and for F support for effective uses of technology. If I have funding set aside for technology out of that Title IV Part A uh, federally funded course, I am required to click that box saying yes, I am engaging in these activities and programs. Okay. The only other thing I want to remind you about with your Title IV Part A, again, make sure that um, when you're transferring your funding, so that 3109, that you do not exceed 30,000 uh, when it comes down to that final amount. Because if you do, and you've been operating all year off of the premise that you didn't have to fully run that program, uh, when it's time for compliance report, uh, it's going to throw you off just a smidge. Because if you have 30,000 or more, TEA is going to uh, expect that you would have fully operated the program. Uh, that's it for your Title IV Part A, which is your program schedule 3107. Right now, we are going to transfer back to Vanessa Velacritas, who will go into the waivers portion a little more in detail. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Vanessa. Okay, we are going to look at the waivers, the uh, 4001 and the 4004. First one, uh, this waiver for Title I Part A, uh, LEAs cannot be seeker. TEA does it if it's required. It is used when LEA is carrying over more than 15% of last year's funding. And the 15% is based on what you didn't spend on the final allocation. So as it, you see up here in the top middle, it says for, uh, for TEA use only. Now, the 4004, the NSLEX Part 1A full wide eligibility waiver. So the NSLEX waiver is only needed if campuses are reporting full wide status. This is a campuses that are not full wide on their own. Uh, they must also be Title I eligible. The only need to complete this waiver the first year. If completed, the LEA will need to verify uh, that the campus meets the requirements to request the waiver, meaning so that LEAs would have documentation locally that shows they completed the process to recommend that the new campus become full wide eligible. You would check the box up here at the top right um, if the waiver is not applicable to you. Okay, let's move on to the SB 5000. All right. So part uh, A your district data. You'll need to enter the district's low income percentage here. Uh, you need to enter the percentage using at least two decimal places. Moving down to part B, campus collection data. Okay, a new option this year is that you can copy uh, prior year's data, and that button is there at the top right. Copy. 
require your data. <laughs> uh, this can save a lot of time, especially in the larger districts. But something to keep in mind is if you have your data already in this campus collection data uh, part B, and then you select to copy as part of your data, everything you've entered will go away. It'll populate with the part of your data. So keep that in mind. Okay, you will have to complete the enrollment number, get your total campus enrollment number, the campus low income percentage, and the PTA per people per people amount. Under basis of eligibility, you have uh, many options, and those options, I can't, this is a PDF, so I can't do the drop down, but for the basis of eligibility, your options are non residing, enrollment, EdFlex, one year transition, full wide program previous year, theater pattern, optional method, and direct certification. Moving to the right, you have part one, part eight, campus status. And of that, you'll select one of four options. Those options are school wide, targeted assistance, like skip campus, and not sure. Your brain span will be populated by our head. Now, if you see that your grade span is incorrect, like say you, your schools have changed, you've gone from a one through five to a one through four and opened up another campus, like five through six, if your grade span shows incorrect, you need to contact the negotiator. If you receive a red box error for your per pupil amount, go to view and print report at the top, it's right here, yeah, the view and print report at the top. And when you hit that, it shows the campuses by rank order. So that error, that uh, PTA error, usually happens because campuses were not ranked correctly. And a uh, quick note about Part B, closed campuses may still display on the SB 5000 several years after being removed from ASCED. So for those campuses, you would indicate zero for enrollment, None for basis of eligibility, 0, 0.00 for low, social, uh, low income percentage, not served for the campus status, and then in the other field, uh, put closed. Part C, campus assurances. So if you selected any of these three, the full wide, target assistance, or SIP campuses assurance, you selected any of those three in part B above, then you'll also select here, and the others will be disabled. All right, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Allison to talk to you about your BS 6001 program budget. Okay, I'm back to talk about your BS pages, which I think are the best section of pages. Okay, that's my BS for that. Um, let's talk about the BS 6001. The good news is that now we're almost finished. We're already in the budget section, right? We've already gone through all the program pages, so way faster this year. So it's pretty exciting. So your BS 6001 is the part, the first part of all your available funding, and it will populate based on your ACC form. So those numbers will be pre-populated, okay? Sorry about that. I clicked on it on accident, you guys. Um, hang on one second while I find out where I can put it. Not sure I did that. Just leave it to me to really the training and we're so close to being done. I mean, if I hadn't done it, you guys would have been like, this is way too well, right? I mean, you know, but I'm so glad I have Lauren and Laura in my same group to help me uh, make sure I stay on track. Thanks, Lauren. Lauren's the best. <laughs> so let me talk about the BS Excel one way to get back to it. Again, you will, um, the available funding will populate for you. Then you'll move into part two, which are your budgeted costs. You'll enter the funds based on objects 
code. So again, for each of your funds, you will allocate the funds based on your object code, okay? If you don't plan on, if there's no money in your 6100 in your payroll account, you won't have to do the BF 6101. So that's exciting, but I recommend that you will be doing the BF 6101. So let me make this a little bigger for you. So make sure you can see it because after I, after I suddenly shut it, it got really tiny again. So now it's large. We can all see it uh, from our old eyes. Okay. So now we're going to move into the BF 6101. So here's where some big things change this year. So remember last year and every other year, so as long as you always send an invoice, you always send a write in every position and the number of how, of, of how many you're going to have in your LEA. Well, not anymore. So that's a good thing. Um, now all you have to do is write in the number of your Part A admin, administrative support or clerical staff. So here you will still need to write in. The amount of positions you will have under each of your funds, each, under each of your funds. So again, the these are integral to the program. And you're probably like, what does that mean? Like, they're all integral, right? Well, what it does mean is they are administrative or clerical services are integral to project or activity. They're individuals who are involved and can be specifically identified in the project. Not somebody who just peripherally does work on the grant fund, but somebody who is integral and who you can specifically identify as somebody who's working in the grant program. Also, these costs must be included in the budget and have had prior written approval, and they're not costs you're going to be covered during indirect costs in any way. Okay, so these are the ones you will write in in Part 1A. As for Parts B and C, all you need to do is just check the box if you will have any professional staff, care professionals, or admin support or clinical staff that's paid with LEA and they're at cost. You will just check the boxes. So again, this is so much simpler. It's just checking boxes. It's not having to write in every position, which is going to save lots of time. However, if you are not paying any payroll or federal funds, you can just click the button up here that says no payroll cost budgeting. And this, the rest of the sheet will be blacked out for you. You don't have to worry about filling anything out. And to get down to part two, substitutes are extra duty benefits. Again, here it is. All you have to do is check the box for any SF fund source. So it doesn't even have to check a box for each title, it's just any SF fund source. So it's for your number one is your school wide personnel, your stipends and extra duty pay, your substitutes, and your incentive pay for positions not indicated above. Okay, so you'll just have to check those boxes. Once you get to part three, it's your confirmation of payroll requirements. This is the, this has always been on the application. It's just saying, you are certifying that these job duties are 100% reasonable and necessary and allowable and allocable, our favorite things to talk about, and that you are, and that you're also documenting this in some way. So again, you will need to keep job descriptions for all your positions because in order to write them in doesn't mean you have to follow any more rules. Unfortunately, you will still need to keep your job descriptions and your time and effort. Those things did not go away. You just save some time in your application. So make sure you check this box. You are confirming that your payroll is indeed necessary and reasonable, allowable, and allocable. Ooh, a lot of letters. Let's move on to your BS 5234, your budget support for 6200. So under your itemized professional and contacted services, you only you'll need to identify your Title III Part A and your part and your immigrant funds. So you'll need to identify the amount in that section. Under LEA assurances in Part B, you'll just be checking boxes to assure that you are not doing anything that requires specific approval. That you're um, then under your Title III Part A immigrant funds, there's no cost budgeting or that have not been under BS 6001. You're just making sure, just for assurance, you we've always had to do that. Was just kind of consolidating into one smaller box. So you go into Part Two, your 6300, and those are your itemized but supplies and materials. If you have funds on your on your BS 6001, you will, these will be open to um, check the boxes. On part three, 6400, itemized other operating costs. Here's where you'll identify for Title III, again, ELA and immigrant, the, the amounts you will be spending in 6411, 6412, uh, which is travel for uh, to conferences, and there's also educational field trips in there. Anything for your stipends for non-employees, other than those in 6419, and non-employee costs for conferences. Again, 6419 are non-employees, not people who are 
see somebody else who's not employed by your LEA to go to a conference or registration. The last section under Part 3 is LEA assurances. So here's again where you want to check the boxes to just assure that you are following the rules and guidelines for Part 8 and for Part 8 immigrants. Okay, so we're going to move into the single final part of this budget support section is Part 4, Program Evaluation and Assessment of Needs. And under each of the fund sources, you're going to check the box yes or no if you are planning on spending any funds on field trips, out of state travel, or if you're planning to host a conference. If you say yes to any of these options, you will need to keep those, that documentation in your field trip form, your out of state travel form, and your conference hosting forms. And those are all on our TEA website. And they're also going to be on our website for you. That way you can always download them and fill them out. So we'll talk about your. The BS 6501 is your program budget for your debt service. And here under each of the funds, you will need to identify if you are indeed budgeting any money for debt service. If you are not, you can click the button at the top that says no debt services are budgeted. And that this again will gray out the schedule for you. So you don't have to worry about continuing to fill out anything else. Um, part two is any property that's under that debt service. Again, if you're not doing anything with your debt service, but those are 6,500 category funds. If you don't have anything in there in your application, you can just hit that no debt service budget button. If you do, make sure you are documenting it here on your application. Again, I want you to act like you may not. If you do, make sure you are documenting your property, property value, if you have any property associated with debt service. So let's talk about your capital outlay, the BS6601. This form did not change from last year. So you will still need to identify which items you're purchasing, which fund source will become, when you hit the drop down box, the fund sources will show up and you'll identify which fund source it is, the number of units, and the nine digit number. So that will be your CDA, your, your county district number, and then the campus number. So you'll need to have a specific campus on where these items will be. Okay? And make sure when you talk about your item description, you don't want to put, I'm buying Apple products, I'm buying Dell products, I'm buying this product, because then if you not buy that and you're selling at a better price on a different brand, you did not get permission for that. You got permission to the grant for a specific item. So I would go as generic but as specific as possible. I know that's not very helpful. It's like you're buying a laptop, so you're purchasing a laptop. So it's a Dell laptop, okay? Um, also, capital outlay is five dollars and above usually, but if your local, if your local policy is that you capitalize at what is selling at five dollars and you will need to fill this out. Doesn't matter that TEA has a higher threshold, you need to follow your local policy your own perspective policy if that is the case. Make sure that you will you do fill out this form even if you did not meet the regular uh, capital outlay threshold. Okay. Then under part two, these are your capital expenditures and those are your library books. Um, I'm talking about books you give in the classroom. These are actual books you'll put in the library that will have a code on them old school, blue decimal, like this is where you're going to identify that and under which funding source. Okay, and anything that you begin to, uh, for capital um, improvements or additions, anything that um, modifications to your capital assets, these will all go in here also. Not a lot of times you use that number two under part two, but should you for this year, make sure you identify that under each funding source that is applicable. And if you have no capital outlay this year, make sure you put that no capital outlay budget. And let me not forget to tell you, if you are planning to spend capital outlay funds, make sure on your BS 6001 you can identify that you do have capital outlay, because if you do put this in here, it will be an error and say there's no money budgeted for capital outlay. So please make sure that you have budgeted that in the front of your budgeting schedule, your budget schedule to make sure it, it aligns with this capital outlay form. All right. I think that means that we're almost done. We're done with going through the application. I do have a couple more things to talk to you about. We're so close to getting done, but not yet. Okay, let's talk about the submission deadline. So everything is due on September 3rd, 2019. Okay, so please know that that is the deadline for your application. If you do have a 12, if you have salaries that are paid on 12 month schedule, you must have them turned in. The July 1 stamp date is critical for you. Otherwise, you will not be able to pay those salaries. Not be able to get in purchasing. Nothing can happen if you're. So I would get it in as early as possible because you know everybody in the state is going to be clamoring to get it in for that July 1 stamping date. And as 
per usual. Maybe this year will be the exception, but I don't think so. This thing, like tease, teal, goes down. It'll go down and you'll be really rushing to get it in. So I suggest get it in as early as possible. If you're in the SSA, there is a deadline of June 12th to have your school forms filled out. So just be sure that you have everything ready because I want to make sure that I get mine in for that July 1st due date. So we all can begin spending money for 1920 on July 1st. Okay. Again, here is our contact information. Myself, Allison Fears, Vanessa Galactitan, Laura Griffin, and Lauren McKinney. We also have Jennifer Phillips. Uh, contact information, she's our Title III ELA and industry uh, consultant, and there's her email address and phone number. So please, please, please reach out to us if you have any questions as you go through this application process. You are not alone, we are here to help. And I want you to know that any, there's no questions that we don't want to hear. If it's silly, just ask us. We'll help you out. And um, thank you so much for joining us for today's 2019-2020 asset application training. Again, thank you so much, and we'll hope to hear from you this summer. Thanks.